for stopping. So. Okay. Now we are both live streaming and recording. Don't forget to introduce Masaki's bicycle as well. <laughs> Bicycle requires no introduction, Piers, <laughs> as you said. If there's any students or younger people who wouldn't mind sharing their video, it's very useful for the speaker to see a spectrum of um, faces so he can gauge whether people are listening or following or not. So, what do you mean? I'm young. <laughs> yeah. We don't need lots of them, but some form of spectrum is um, quite useful. Thank you. Andrew, good time to go, I think. Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone to the third day of condensed matter physics in all of the cities. Um, before we start, I'd like to remind you of the etiquette of our meeting. So please mute your microphones. And um, Zoom is most stable when there are not too many videos open. But as Sam said, it's nice to have a few people with their videos on in order to give the speaker visual feedback and a sense that they're actually speaking to someone live. We encourage interaction during the talks. And if you have a question, just raise your hand by pressing the button in the participants list or else write something in the chat and one of the moderators will, will ask you to speak. And finally, I'd like to draw your attention to the student contributed talks on the web page. If you are a student, there's still a chance to submit your talk and there will be a prize of some sort. We're not quite decided what yet, but there'll be a prize and a chance for the winning talk to be delivered live next week. Okay, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker, Professor Masaki Ashikawa from the University of Tokyo. Professor Ashikawa completed his PhD in the Komoto group at the University of Tokyo before postdocs in Professor Nagayoza's group in Tokyo and then with uh, Ian Affleck in UBC. And he returned to a series of faculty positions in Tokyo. He's well known as well as for his bison in low dimensional quantum systems, including seminal works on holding gaps and fractionalization in topological phases, the classification of symmetry protected quantum phases, and recently for the demonstration that time crystals cannot exist in equilibrium. He's been, been awarded a number of prizes in recognition of these contributions and including the GASPS prize. And it's great that Professor Oshikawa is able to join us despite being all the way in Tokyo and um, without further ado, I'll give the floor to him. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing a very nice uh, workshop, very stimulating. Um, I still miss the you know, old days when we could travel to New York, London, Paris, wherever. But uh, yeah, this online meeting has its advantages. So uh, I hope. We can, yeah, we, I already enjoyed the uh, last two days and uh, I hope uh, you can, and we can enjoy this uh, meeting. So, um, so I'm giving uh, two talks in this meeting. So first one is today and the second one will be given uh, next Friday. 
And uh, today my talk is entitled uh, Applications of Adiabatic Flux Insertion to Quantum Anybody Systems. And um, yeah, so yeah, this is today's talk. And uh, I'm going to talk about mostly old stuff. So uh, many of you already know this result. So I apologize if there is nothing new, new for you today. Um, but uh, next week, uh, I'm going to talk about something related stuff, but uh, uh, some new results we obtained recently, and uh, they are kind of related. So yeah, actually, I think Piers asked me to be pedagogical. So today, I will be uh, really pedagogical. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Maybe too easy for some of you, but uh, yeah, still I hope it's interesting. Okay, um, so yeah, I start from very basic, like uh, undergraduate lectures. So uh, yeah, we are familiar with uh, vector potential appearing in uh, electromagnetism, but it can be naturally understood maybe more natural from abstract point of view. So even if you don't know anything about uh, electromagnetism, uh, you can start from quantum mechanics, then you can observe that uh, in quantum mechanics, there is a natural U1 symmetry. That is, uh, if you change the phase of the wave function everywhere by uh, constant phase theta, then there is no observable difference. So that means that the quantum mechanics has a U1 global symmetry that corresponds to a global change of the phase of the wave function. But uh, you can enhance this to a gauge symmetry that allows you to change the phase. Um, the, this phase factor theta now depends on location of the space. So each point in the space you can change the wave function by some arbitrary phase. So that sounds uh, too much of the freedom because if you do that, then you seem to destroy any uh, useful information. But uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, so wave function can appear as a density like a psi absolute value squared, which is not changed by this gauge transformation. And uh, also through derivative, like this nabla psi, uh, then you can replace the ordinary derivative by so-called covariant derivative. So derivative minus i times a. So this a is a new uh, field, uh, gauge connection or something. And this is nothing but vector potential. And uh, when you do this um, gauge transformation of the wave function, putting arbitrary phase, then this uh, vector potential new gauge field should be transformed like this. You add the gradient of theta. So if you do these transformations together, then uh, this uh, covariant derivative is gauge invariant because uh, the two corrections cancel out. So this is gauge invariant. And uh, this covariant derivative can be uh, understood in a following way. So usual derivative, I just take uh, one of the component, is uh, you take the difference of, let's say, wave function from uh, one point in the space R and the nearby point R plus uh, delta some direction. Then you take the difference and then uh, divide by the distance. So this is uh, and then, then take limit of delta goes to zero. This is a derivative. But uh, this covariant derivative can be understood like uh, you take the difference, but uh, before taking the difference, you do so-called parallel transport. You, you need to compare wave functions at two points, but uh, you cannot directly compare because uh, once you allow gauge transformation, you can change the phase of the wave function in any way you like. That means that uh, when you compare two wave functions, you first transport one wave function to the different position. And uh, in doing so, you acquire phase. And uh, this extra phase is represented by uh, this uh, gauge field vector potential. 
Um, so this is a, a idea behind the covariant derivative. Then um, you can uh, apply to this to physical program. So for example, if electron starts at point A and uh, reaches another point B in space, then you can understand this in pass integral formalism. Of course, I skip uh, mathematical details, but uh, you can represent a process of particle, quantum mechanical particle moving from point A to point B as summation over all possible paths, and uh, each path contributes some quantum amplitude, and then you sum them together. Um, but uh, uh, presence of vector potential means that uh, when you count the contribution uh, to the quantum amplitude uh, from one particular path P, the wave function must be parallel transported through this path. So you should uh, introduce extra phase, uh, which is an integral of uh, vector potential dot dr uh, integrated over this path. And if you have two different, so if you just consider a single bus, then this phase does nothing. But uh, you need to sum over many different paths. So if you consider these two different paths, P and P prime, then uh, presence of vector potential introduces one particular phase uh, like this to uh, contribution from path P and uh, to the contribution from pass P prime, you get another uh, phase. I forgot the I here. So the relative phase is given by the difference. Then you can write this as a, a contour integral along this uh, cross pass, which I denote as uh, DS. So the presence of vector potential generally does affect the quantum mechanical motion of the particle because uh, this uh, circular integral is generally non-zero. And uh, you can write uh, this contour integral along the closed loop, which gives a uh, phase difference for these two paths as uh, uh, integral of rotation of A, uh, for this uh, surface uh, enclosed by this loop. Uh, this is nothing but uh, Stokes theorem. And this, uh, in physics, we know that uh, this rotation of the vector potential is nothing but a uh, gauge field. And uh, this gauge field is a uh, gauge variant. Uh, you do gauge transformation, but uh, this rotation A doesn't change. Uh, that is, how it should be because uh, this gauge transformation is actually you can do whatever you like, uh, but the phase difference should be uh, physical. Um, so this uh, physical quantity can be generally represented by uh, rotation A, that is magnetic field. Um, so so far it seems like uh, only gauge invariant quantity. Is, is physical, like a magnetic field and electric field, and uh, that is true. But the question is uh, whether magnetic field and also electric field, which I didn't talk about, but uh, those fields are enough to understand the physics because uh, it looks like a vector potential is ambiguous. You can change the value of vector potential in any way by uh, gauge transformation. So it looks like I am physical, and it looks like uh, just a mathematical trick. And actually, when we learn vector potential for the first time in traditional curriculum, uh, it's introduced as a kind of mathematical uh, trick just to represent magnetic field. But uh, in quantum mechanics, it's not so simple because we can consider uh, this kind of uh, configuration. So now we have annular shaped system. And uh, I put quantum mechanical particles inside this uh, annulus that is in colored region. But uh, this annulus has a hole. And uh, inside hole and outside this system, the particle cannot go out. And uh, I just put magnetic 
flux inside this hole. Then uh, particles cannot enter inside this hole, and the magnetic field is zero outside this hole. That means that the particles cannot touch the magnetic field directly. So if you write down classical equation of motion, then these particles uh, never feel the magnetic field, so they are never affected by magnetic field. But uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, the presence of non-zero flux affects the motion of particle on this annulus because of the phase difference I just discussed. So even though uh, particles don't touch the magnetic field uh, directly, uh, when particle moves from point A to point B inside this annulus, uh, two different paths uh, going around this hole in opposite way uh, picks up different phase, and uh, this phase difference is affected by the magnetic flux inside the hole. So this is very remarkable phenomenon uh, predicted by Harno -Bohm and Bohm, and are now experimentally confirmed uh, many times. So this is VR. Um, so this is very interesting. But, uh, the point is that uh, uh, the quantum system of many particles defined on, on this annulus uh, generally does depend on the flux. Uh, nothing but a effect. But uh, there are exceptions. Uh, that is when uh, this uh, total flux through the hole is two pi times integer then what happens is that uh, this phase difference, which is the only effect uh, from this flux that is felt by particles, become uh, two pi times integer. But uh, this is phase difference. So phase difference two pi is nothing. So even though there is a non-zero flux, magnetic flux inside this hole, uh, these particles on uh, annulus can never know whether there is uh, zero flux or two pi flux inside. So in this special case, uh, even in quantum mechanics, uh, there is no effect of flux uh, on particles uh, moving around in annulus. So this is called a uh, unit flux quantum, but uh, I have to say that uh, uh, so far, I have implicitly chosen the uh, special units so that uh, h by equals one and uh, uh, charge of the electron or any uh, constituent particle I'm studying has charge one. But uh, if you go to physical unit, then uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, covariant derivative appears as a kinetic momentum of the particle, and uh, this momentum operator is like a minus i h bar times the uh, nabla and the minus charge of the particle e times vector potential. So the uh, total phase difference uh, for quantum mechanical particle enclosing some area is given by the magnetic flux divided by some units. This is a unit flux quantum. And uh, this ratio times two pi i. So when this magnetic flux becomes phi zero, then inside the hole has a, a magnetic flux, total magnetic flux phi zero, then the phase becomes two pi, then there is no effect on quantum mechanical particle. And this phi zero in usual unit is, uh, I mean, SI unit is given by Frank constant H over E, which is uh, four times 10 to minus 15 wave waiver. But uh, in the rest of my talk, I take uh, this convenient unit for series. So it's just two pi is a unit flux quantum. And uh, also, I, to avoid any confusion, in many textbooks and uh, papers, uh, phi zero is actually defined as uh, h over 2e, because in superconductivity, it's Cooper pair what matters. So uh, uh, we see periodicity in a uh, unit of h over 2e. So more often, half of this value is quoted as unit flux quantum. But uh, for my purpose, I want to track the motion of electron, not necessarily Cooper pair. So I use this as a unit. OK. So um, now I consider general uh, 
uh, system of many particles on annulus, let's say, and uh, put magnetic flux inside the whole of the, this annulus. And uh, I haven't specified yet what kind of system we are concerning, but uh, whatever system you have, you must have Hamiltonian. And uh, in principle, you, have, you, you, you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian and uh, obtain the spectrum. So for, oops, sorry. For given value of flux, like a flux zero, you must find a bunch of uh, eigenstates of Hamiltonian, that is energy level. And uh, if you change phi, then uh, of course Hamiltonian generally depends on phi, and this is nothing but the uh, Ahran of Bohm effect. So even though there should be no classical effect, uh, quantum mechanical system is affected. So the energy spectrum generally depends on phi. Although for very large system, uh, we can expect that uh, this uh, effect of magnetic flux is not too large. Um, the precise meaning of that I will discuss later, but, uh, but uh, anyway, the spectrum generally depends on this flux inside the hole. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you increase this flux and uh, reach when the flux reaches the uh, unit flux quantum 2 pi, then the particles don't know if there is a flux inside. So in this case, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian for uh, 2 pi flux, unit flux quantum inside the hole uh, should be completely identical to the uh, spectrum at zero flux. So that's sounds like a Hamiltonian at phi equals to two pi is equal to a Hamiltonian at phi equals zero, but uh, these Hamiltonians are not equal because uh, when you have flux two pi, you must have a non-zero vector potential to represent this flux. Um, but uh, at phi equals zero, you, you have zero vector potential. So these two Hamiltonians are different because you have different vector potential. But uh, you must still have uh, this, uh, uh, identical spectrum and uh, each energy level of course must um, be physically equivalent. And uh, so this equivalence can be seen um, in terms of gauge transformation. That is, oh, there's a typo. Um, the Hamiltonian at two pi flux is uh, equal to Hamiltonian, sorry, I dropped uh, H, Hamiltonian at zero flux, but uh, they are related by some unitary transformation UX. And uh, this unitary transformation is nothing but a gauge transformation. And uh, on the lattice, I can write down the gauge transformation operator explicitly, but uh, it's easier to maybe understand in uh, single particle quantum mechanics in continuous space, because uh, as I said, in generally, uh, I allow uh, gauge transformation with arbitrary phase, but uh, in order to eliminate unit flux quantum inside the hole, I chose I choose the this phase factor as some increasing function of uh, location along the hole. So when you go around the hole along the annulus inside the annulus, this phase factor increases from zero to two pi. And uh, it looks like a multivalued function or it is in certain sense, but uh, the phase is only meaningful modulo two pi. So if you start from one point and uh, increase theta, and uh, when you come back to the original point, theta is two pi, but uh, two pi phase is equivalent to zero. So this is okay. This is allowed as a uh, uh, gauge transformation. So this is a topologically non-trivial gauge transformation, which maps the uh, two pi flux wave function back to the uh, uh, original Hamiltonian with zero flux. Okay, so this uh, discussion applies to single particle quantum mechanics and whatever quantum system. But uh, now I want to apply this kind of idea to uh, quantum many body system, that is a system of many quantum particles. And uh, then if you go to some limit, there are infinitely many states, so it's complicated. 
But uh, we can roughly divide uh, quantum many body system into two distinct classes. And uh, one class is called gapped, and the other class is called gapless. And the difference is that uh, generally you should be able to identify the ground state, which has the lowest energy among all the states. And uh, in gapped system, you have a ground state and uh, there is a continuum of excited states because there are infinite number of states in some other limit. But uh, these excited states are separated from ground state by some non-zero energy, which is called gap. Um, the, the other class, gapless, is the limit of this gap going to zero, means that uh, you have a ground state, then a continuum of excited states uh, begins just above the uh, ground state which means that uh, you can create excitation at, with uh, arbitrarily small energy, in infinitesimal energy, you can create excitation. So these are two basic classes. And uh, first I want to uh, focus on this gapped case because uh, this is easier to deal with in various senses. Okay. So, so I, first consider or assume that a system has a gap, that is, it has a ground state uh, separated from uh, excited states by a non-zero gap, which means that uh, this ground state is kind of stable. You need to give the system uh, finite energy that is more than the gap to create any excitation. And uh, then I consider this adiabatic flux insertion. So I start from some many body system, which has a gap of the ground state. And uh, I start from the uh, ground state, then insert this Ahano bone flux adiabatically from zero to unit flux quantum two pi. And uh, I assume that uh, this many body gap does not collapse by the Ahano bone flux. So this is, uh, of course, non-trivial assumption because uh, as I mentioned previously, in general, the energy spectrum can depend on phi. So in general, there is no guarantee that, that some value of phi this gap closes, but uh, uh, in many body system, large enough system, I assume that uh, this uh, gap doesn't close. And uh, of course, it's not rigorous statement, but uh, still physically reasonable. And uh, I'm not aware of any counter example with any short range uh, interacting Hamilton. But I don't know the proof in general. But uh, later I will argue that uh, this assumption is actually must be true for insulators in two dimension or one dimension. But uh, I will leave this to later discussion. And uh, for the moment, I just assume that uh, this gap doesn't close even if you introduce AB flux. Um, once you accept this assumption, then that means that the ground state is always separated from excited states by gap. So if you introduce this flux adiabatically, then you should follow, always follow ground state. So ground states must remain in the ground state. And after inserting the unit flux quantum, then spectrum goes back to the spectrum at phi equals zero. And if this assumption is true, then you must come back to the ground state of the original Hamiltonian. Yeah. Well, I spoke uh, basically what I have written here. So I assume that the uh, gap does not cross and uh, I insert a flux very slowly, then the time evolution must be adiabatic. So starting from the ground state at phi equals zero, we must come back to the ground state at phi equals two pi. But uh, because, yeah, again, I forgot to put H. Uh, again, these two uh, Hamiltonians are equivalent, which means that uh, you start from the ground state and uh, you come back to the ground state basically all the same system. Then it sounds like a, I just come back to the same ground state. If that is the case, not so much interesting, but uh, actually interesting point is that uh, sometimes it's impossible 
for you to come back to the uh, same ground state as the starting point. And uh, if that happens, then there are various possibilities. Uh, one possibility is that uh, your assumption that uh, you have a, a gap uh, was wrong. So in that case, the system is gapless. And uh, another possibility is that actually the ground state is not unique. That is, there are multiple ground states which are degenerate. Then you can start from one ground state and uh, come back to a different ground state. So that is a possibility. So th this is rather a non-trivial conclusion. Uh, sometimes you can make. So I will discuss one of such examples. Uh, that is uh, a case of fractionalization. Yeah, I chose this because uh, Claudio and Sentu talked about this fractionalization. So maybe it's worth mentioning here. So. Uh, if you attended uh, Claudio's or Sentio's talk, you have heard about this, but uh, I want to define this uh, phenomenon in very general grounds. Although they already made a point, I guess, but still I want to make it abstract. So in condensed matter physics, uh, materials are made of protons and neutrons and electrons and uh, all those particles have uh, integral multiples of unit charge E, which we know. Um, so, um, yeah, I call this in constituent particles, although maybe it's more common to call elementary particles uh, because uh, in condensed matter physics, we use the word elementary excitation, which has a very different meaning. And I also, Musaki. I want to, yeah. I have two questions for you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I would, which come from the chat. Uh, yeah. One question is Is this the same as an insulator in a magnetic field? Uh, mm -hmm. Or does the insulator have to be a ring with a flux inserted into the hole inside the ring? Will it make any difference? That's the first question. Uh, so the first question is, uh, so... Is this, this the same as an insulator in a magnetic field, just a regular insulator, or do you have to have this kind of toroidal geometry? Uh, well, so for, for my, my, my argument, I'm considering the toroidal geometry, yeah. So, so I'm just uh, uh, discussing the response to the Aharonov bone flux inside the hole. Uh, okay, and the, that was from yeah. Om Prakash. And the second question from Alexei... Uh, uh, yeah, the Roskov is that can it happen that the ground state is degenerate mm -hmm. with the gap, uh, but each state maps to itself oh. after the large gauge transformation? Yeah, okay, so it's I think generally possible, but uh, such degeneracy is kind of accidental from this point of view. So I want to derive some degeneracy which I can argue from adiabatic evolution, but uh, mm -hmm. of course, there is always possibility that uh, there are degeneracy because of other reasons. Um, in that case, we have more degeneracy. But, uh, and, there's a question, and there's a question now from Gennady Chito. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, yeah. you, if you have a gap, is it possible yeah. to have a gap without degeneracy? Pardon me. Uh, we suppose there is a gap and... Sorry, I couldn't hear the question very well. The question is uh, in, in your next slide that uh -huh. uh, okay. is it possible that but basically if you have a gap something which is broken mm -hmm. so you're supposed to have a degeneracy what I'm mm -hmm. asking is it possible that you have a gap without degeneracy well so if you know you start from one ground state and uh, do adiabatic evolution and uh, if I can show that the final state must be different from initial state then uh, if there is a gap, then you must have degeneracy. That's what I want to argue. But uh, I haven't shown yet that uh, the final <laughs> so state. So we agree. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So so uh, I, I'm just giving the general picture first. That is sometimes I can argue that the final state must be different from uh, initial state. Of course, it's not always the case. Yeah. Of course, sometimes you you just come back to the original ground state and the ground state is unique. But sometimes uh, it cannot happen. And I'm going to discuss a few such examples. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions at this point? 
Okay, so, um, so, and also I, I maybe uh, also want to consider a very abstract model, maybe not directly related to reality, but uh, some lattice model, Hubbard-like model with uh, various particles hopping around on the lattice. And uh, I can assign any charge to each particle. And uh, that charge may be different from electron charge, but uh, still in my model, each particle has uh, some charge and uh, sometimes uh, this charge is integral multiple of some unit charge. And uh, I also want to consider that kind of situation. So by constituent particles, I mean some particle appearing in my micro microscopic Hamiltonian. But uh, over many years, uh, yeah, there is some question. Uh, if the particle charge is neutral, okay, good question. So, of course, um, uh, physically, uh, if the particle has neutral charge, then it doesn't couple to real gauge field, so you cannot do this argument. But uh, for theoretical purpose, uh, if you have conserved charge, then I can always introduce some fictitious gauge field, which couples to this uh, conserved charge uh, and uh, do the same uh, adiabatic flux insertion. That's just for theoretical discussion, that's what. Um, okay, so now my, I have some well-defined Hamiltonian, microscopic Hamiltonian and uh, in that model, particles are moving around, and uh, each particle has an uh, integral multiple of a uh, unit charge. And uh, that's also happening in the real world. But uh, over many years, we learned that uh, some systems show a very remarkable phenomenon called uh, fractionization, which means that, uh, uh, yeah, typically you have a ground state, maybe gapped ground state, well, not always, but. Uh, then you create excitations and then excitations uh, can be described as a collection of quasi particles as introduced by um, introduced by uh, Claudio and Centil. And uh, sometimes these quasi particles uh, carry fractional charge, not integral multiple, but uh, let's say one third or one quarter of the unit charge. And uh, that sounds very weird. So it sounds like uh, you smashed uh, electron or constituent, constituent particle by very high energy and uh, this electron is broken into several pieces, but it's not uh, the fractionization we have in condensed matter because uh, in our microscopy model, like Hubbard model, we don't allow electron just break into several pieces. But uh, still, fractionization uh, happens uh, because uh, fractions, these quasi particles are rather very complicated collective excitation involving many, many electrons. And uh, still, quasi particle moves around like a particle and carry fractional charge. Okay. So, this is, of course, highly non trivial. And I'm not going to show how this can happen. So that was a topic of uh, Claudio and Centio. But uh, what I want to argue today is what should follow if this kind of fractionization happens? Um, yeah, I think I tried to answer Paul Yao's uh, question or no. Uh, yeah, so even if charge neutral, if there is conserved charge, you can uh, uh, you can uh, couple to fictitious gauge field. And a related comment I wrote in the uh, lower part of the slide. So this notion of charge can be generalized. Uh, for example, if you have electron, you know that the, the, the uh, it has charge E and spin one half, but uh, you can combine them together like uh, uh, SZ plus uh, electric charge over 2E 
So that's a one half plus one half or minus one half plus one half. So it's zero or one. So this uh, combined charge spin plus uh, uh, electric charge is integer for electrons. But uh, if you have some strongly correlated system, more to ensure it, uh, uh, sometimes people talk about horons or spinons, like a centivit. And the spinon is supposed to carry a spin one half, no charge, and the horons are supposed to carry uh, unit charge, uh, but a zero spin. And uh, those uh, quantum numbers seems to be legitimate, but uh, you know the spinon has uh, this uh, general charge one half, and the horons also have this uh, combined general right, charge one half. So in this sense, uh, horons and spinons are fractionalized particles, uh, which you know can occur, but uh, it's rather non-trivial object because it uh, involves some uh, fractionalization. Okay, so uh, what I want to discuss is uh, uh, what must follow from just a general assumption that uh, I have a fractionalized quasar particle. So I assume that, uh, as I said, uh, my microscopic Hamiltonian is well defined and are made of some constituent particle with unit charge. And uh, for sake of discussion, I assume that the system is gapped and that this gap is stable against the uh, Aranov bone phase, uh, Aranov bone flux, which is non trivial discussion. So, this is not to say that the fractionalization cannot be defined for gapless system. Maybe we can, but uh, it's more complicated. So, uh, here I just want to focus on a uh, gapped system with uh, fractionalized quasi particle excitations. And uh, now I assume that the quasi part, so uh, we have quasi particle and quasi hole in the system, and uh, those have a uh, fractional charge uh, plus and minus p over q. p and q are uh, mutually uh, co prime integers. So it, uh, it's a rational number uh, charge in some unit charge. Then I also assume that uh, by some local perturbation, I can create quasi-particle, quasi-hole pair, of course, respecting the charge conservation. And also, I assume that I can drag this quasi-particle, quasi-hole around by some moving some potential or something. And this is not totally a trivial assumption, because recently we hear about so-called fractons many times, very often. And the fractons are kind of particles you cannot freely move around. But uh, here I don't consider fractons. And uh, this quasar particle can, can be dragged around. And so these are very generic assumptions. But uh, somewhat surprisingly, only from this assumption, I can say something rather strong. And uh, yeah, this is a content of my paper we sent you some years ago. So now I want to introduce uh, this Aranov bone flux uh, adiabatically. And uh, formally, this can be defined uh, in terms of some uh, uh, unitary operator Fx, which corresponds to this adiabatic flux insertion. So you know, it's easy to imagine. But uh, precisely speaking, this corresponds to some time evolution with respect to the uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian. So you just increase vector potential linearly in time. And uh, this is time-dependent Hamiltonian. But uh, you can define, the, with time ordering, uh, you can define a, a time evolution operator for this process. And uh, this precisely does this process. And uh, I call this Fx. And uh, I also introduce another process, which I call Tx. And uh, this is also time evolution. But as I said, uh, uh, so this system is gapped. By, but uh, by introducing some external perturbation, uh, I can create a quasi-particle whole pair 
And then after creation, I drag this quasi particle. For example, I add some potential to trap this quasi particle and then drag this around. Of course, if you really try to define this operator precisely, it's very complicated. Even uh, numerically implementing this kind of operator is, uh, should be very complicated, but uh, this is kind of a uh, Gedanken experiment, uh, which uh, we theorists can do. <coughs> okay, then after dragging this quasar particle around this hole, then this quasar particle meets a uh, quasar hole again, then I can pair annihilate. And uh, after annihilating this quasar particle hole pair, uh, you know, no excitation is left. So we must go back to uh, vacuum or ground state. So we just consider these uh, two process. Okay, so the first process FX introduces uh, two pi flux inside the hole. But uh, as we have seen, you know, this two pi flux, unit flux quantum uh, shouldn't affect uh, shouldn't have a Aharonov bone effect for original particle, electron or constituent particle, because it just introduces two pi pairs. But uh, now we assume that we have quasi particle with fraction charge, and uh, I consider the process of dragging uh, quasi particle around this hole. And uh, because this quasi particle has fraction charge, uh, even this uh, unit flux quantum is non-trivial because uh, now with unit flux quantum inside the hole, uh, this quasi-particle quasi uh, going around the hole picks up phase two pi times p over q, which is non-trivial. So once we have fractionalized quasi-particle, we can detect uh, this uh, uh, unit flux quantum quantum inside the hole. So this can be uh, formally written in terms of this operator relation. So Tx uh, of phi zero is uh, this uh, quasi-particle creation, moving, annihilation process in the, in the presence of unit flux quantum. So this means that uh, you first insert flux by Fx, then you get the uh, flux phi zero inside the hole. Then you do this uh, creation dragging annihilation process. But uh, you can change the order. So in the right hand side, you first create a quasi particle hole pair and then move quasi particle around the hole. Then you uh, pair annihilate. Then after that, you insert the flux. So this quasi particle dragging process is done with uh, zero flux inside the hole. So if you change the order, now only the left hand side picks up this extra Aharonov bone phase. So they are not equal, but uh, they are related by this extra phase factor of e to two pi i p over q. So this is uh, what we can just deduce from uh, uh, the fact that, uh, or assumption that uh, my quasi particle carries fraction charge. But at this point, you know, this is just a relation between three different operators. So I cannot say anything directly from this yet. But the uh, point is that, uh, um, so this Tx is again uh, represented by some time evolution operator with respect to certain time dependent Hamiltonian, like uh, adding potential and uh, moving potential around. So it's complicated, but uh, you can uh, always define at least in principle. Then because this Hamiltonian is microscopic Hamiltonian defined with respect to the constituent particle, uh, electrons and so on, uh, you can always relate uh, this Hamiltonian even with potential or something uh, in the presence of uh, unit flux quantum phi zero to uh, a Hamiltonian with zero flux inside. And uh, they are always related by large gauge transformation like this. 
So the time evolution operator should be always uh, also related like this. So time evolution operator is quasi-particle creation, dragging, annihilation operator in the presence of a uh, unit flux quantum must be given by the gauge, large gauge transformation of uh, same process with uh, zero flux inside the hole. So you have this relation. So you just plug in this uh, relation to the equation I got in the previous slide. So this just shows the uh, non-trivial Ahanobon effect for quasi-particle. So if you uh, plug in, then you can derive this relation in this way. The relation between Tx0 and Fx tilde. And uh, here Fx tilde is just defined by ux times, oh, sorry, there is a typo. So ux times just a fx, sorry about that. Erase this thing. So fx tilde means that uh, you insert a flux adiabatically, and after that, you eliminate this vector potential by gauge transformation. And uh, tx0 is uh, just a quasi particle dragging process in the presence of zero flux. So it looks innocent operator. But uh, now I have derived non trivial commutation relation between fx tilde and tx. So if you change the order, you pick up extra phase, which means that uh, this uh, fx tilde operator, which is just uh, adiabatic insertion of flux, unit flux quantum inside the hole, then you eliminate this vector potential by gauge transformation. So it sounds like a, you know, it's trivial process. You introduce a flux, but it's just a unit flux quantum, so you can eliminate, so okay, you eliminate then sounds like uh, you must come back to the original ground state. But uh, you cannot, because uh, this process just changed the uh, you know, eigenvalue of uh, Tx0 by this non-trivial phase factor. So that means that uh, once you assume the existence of fractionalized quantum quasi-particle, uh, this uh, simple, process of adiabatic insertion of unit flux quantum then uh, elimination by large gauge transformation must bring you to different states. So if you have a gap, you must come, come back to the ground state, but uh, this ground state must be different from the original one. So in this way, uh, you must have ground state decisions only from the assumption of the existence of uh, fractionalized quasi particle. And uh, you can repeat this process, and uh, this phase factor is non-trivial, so you can repeat this argument, and uh, you can show that uh, there are at least two-fold ground state agents using the same argument. And uh, even strongly, if we can consider the same system on more complicated topology, that is, let's say uh, I have two dimensional system and uh, I consider two dimensional manifold, orientable manifold uh, with genus G, which roughly means that uh, you have G holes. So usual torus corresponds to G equals one, but uh, this uh, double torus in this right has two holes. So this corresponds to G equals to G, G equals to two. And uh, for this kind of system, we can, uh, insert adiabatically flux at least uh, to these two different holes, phi one and phi two, and I can repeat the same argument because I just need to insert a flux and uh, drag quasi particle around this hole or this hole. So you can apply the same argument to each hole. Then uh, what I can show is that uh, uh, if I have fractionalized quasi particle charge P over Q, then this system has a minimum ground state agency Q to the power of G. Actually, if these quasi-particles are simply boson of fermions, uh, I can get a stronger result. But anyway, uh, if Q is not one, that is, if you have fractionalization, then as you go to higher and higher topology, the ground state agency must increase. And uh, this kind of degeneracy cannot be a consequence of uh, usual spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, this kind of degeneracy is uh, what is called uh, topological degeneracy. And uh, this topological degeneracy, ground state degeneracy, depending on the topology of the manifold, 
uh, uh, is considered to be a signature of uh, so-called topological order, which is abstract notion. Uh, I'm not going to into detail how how to define topological order and uh, how to understand, but uh, um, I just want to say that uh, uh, what I have just done is that uh, I just made a very general assumption: a gap system, anybody system, and uh, just assume that the uh, uh, fractionalized quasi particle exists. Then you must have uh, this topological efficiency. So, which means that uh, in order to have fractionalization, uh, you must have uh, topological order, at least in this sense. So this uh, is one evidence that the fractionalization is not uh, just simply splitting electron, but uh, a very highly non-trivial many-body phenomenon. So, uh, So this is first topic I, oops, I wanted to explain. Yeah, I use up most of my time, but uh, if you have uh, any question uh, on this point. Mazaki, can I, uh, play, can I play the role of a fool? Can you do that one more time? With your expression tau x f tilde equals yeah. f tilde tau of zero. Mm -hmm. the I phase factor. Can yeah. You, one more time, give us the physical interpretation of that expression. Oh, this one? Yes. This one? Yes. Okay. So, um, so uh, Fx introduces uh, unit flux quantum inside the whole adiabatically. Mm -hmm. So when you, uh, so left hand side means that you start from zero flux and uh, Fx adiabatically introduces uh, unit flux quantum inside the hole. Mm -hmm. Then after doing that, you uh, create quasi-particle hole pair and then drag the quasi-particle around and then a pair annihilate quasi-particle hole. Mm -hmm. Then you go back to vacuum or ground state. So that is the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is you start from zero flux and uh, you first do quasi-particle uh, whole pair creation and the drag the quasi particle around the hole, then pair annihilate. Then you go back to the vacuum or ground state. Then after that, you uh, insert uh, you insert the uh, unit flux quantum adiabatically. So these two process uh, very similar, but uh, because uh, of the different ordering. In the left-hand side, you your quasi-particle travels around the hole in the presence of unit flux quantum inside the hole. And uh, this unit flux quantum shouldn't give you any non-trivial AB phase for electron constituent particle because the phase should be two pi. But uh, here you are dragging a uh, fractionally charged quasi-particle around the hole. So even for the unit flux quantum, you pick up a uh, non-trivial Ahanov-Bohm phase. That is two pi times uh, IP over Q. And the interpretation when you put the F tilde in? Okay, so the next slide is just a mathematical uh, uh, deformation. So, so well, first, I want to accept this relation, okay? Then uh, I argue that uh, because uh, this Tx uh, in the presence of unit flux quantum inside should be written as a time evolution with respect to certain time-dependent Hamiltonian in the presence of uh, unit flux quantum inside. Uh, so this Hamiltonian must be always related to Hamiltonian uh, with zero flux inside a hole by large gauge transformation. So my uh, Tx in the presence of unit flux quantum inside is also large gauge transformation of the same process TX0. Um, you just do the large gauge transformation. And uh, in the previous slide, I obtained this formula and uh, I just uh, plug in this formula to the left hand side. So it's like uh, UX inverse TX0 FX equals to FX times uh, TX0 uh, times. 
times this phase. Then uh, left hand side becomes a u inverse tx time tx zero times u fx. So I combine u fx into fx tilde. Sorry, so there is a type of uh, on the right hand side there is no tilde. So you find a u fx. So you I combine into fx tilde. Then left hand side becomes uh, u times uh, sorry u inverse times uh, tx times fx tilde. So you move u inverse to the right hand side. Then this fx becomes uh, ux times fx, that is fx tilde. So you can just rewrite this relation to this form using uh, this identity. Then now this becomes a kind of commutation relation between uh, tx0 and fx tilde, which shows that uh, you just create quasi-particle pair, quasi-particle whole pair at zero flux and uh, move quasi-particle around and then pair annihilate. But uh, the, the, if you change the order between this process and the uh, flux insertion plus gauge transformation, then depending on the order, you get the uh, extra phase. So this is, I don't know how to interpret intuitively, but uh, um, uh, this is what I can derive. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, this directly implies the uh, ground state degeneracy in case of gap system. Yeah. There's also three questions, three hands raised. So the first is from Masaru Hongo. If you'd yeah. like to answer yeah. that's your question. Guess that this FX is a uh, adiabatic realization of the uh, large gauge transformation. So it is related to the symmetry. And uh, how about TX? And TX is somehow related to the symmetry transformation? Or? Um, good question. Um, um, yeah, so TX probably is some kind of symmetry, although I don't know how to express. So um, yeah, so TX, I guess uh, in general doesn't commute with Hamiltonian. So it's not symmetry generator in uh, standard sense. Uh, also FX, because uh, if you start from excited state, then insert a uh, flux adiabatically, then you can increase the energy or decrease the energy depending on the starting point. So that means that the uh, Hamiltonian does not commute with FX or TX. So those are not the symmetry generator in the usual sense. But uh, what I'm using here is that uh, if you project onto ground state subspace, uh, if you just start from the ground state and then apply this operator, then you end up with uh, one of the ground states. So if you restrict the Hilbert space to the ground state, ground state subspace, then these uh, operators act like a symmetry generator. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to uh, express this in more formal terms. Um, so maybe this is also related to, uh, let's say, topological quantum field theory kind of stuff, because uh, very roughly speaking, topological quantum field theory is uh, you just look at this ground state subspace and forget about all those excitations. So, um, so you mean that the, this, this operator does not commute with uh, Hamiltonian? Right, right. But uh, I, I think they commute with uh, Hamiltonian projected to ground state subspace or something like that. So it, it's a symmetry generator in some weak sense. Uh, in my understanding. Yeah, maybe there is a better way to express, but uh, yeah, my, my understanding is something like that. So the next question is from Srijith. Yes, uh, my question is uh, pretty much related to the previous question. Uh, so here we are labeling the different uh, ground states, uh, degenerate ground states, based on the eigenvalues of Tx of mm -hmm. zero, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means uh, for us to label states using uh, the eigenvalues of an operator, it should commute with the uh, 
Yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear your okay. question very well. But but uh, so the argument is that uh, okay. So uh, yeah, you you diagonalize T X in ground state subspace. Mm -hmm. uh, then each so each degenerate eigenstate uh, has some particular eigenvalue, and then applying FX still the shifts the eigenvalue of T X. So. Yeah, different ground yeah. states are related by. So, the uh, you, commutes with the Hamiltonian, at least in the ground state. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, so projection to the ground state subspace should commute uh, because, uh, you know, we, in, in case of FX, we assume that the gap doesn't collapse, which means that uh, you start from the ground state, then you should end up with a ground state, which means that. Uh, uh, fx or fx tilde applied to the ground state subspace uh, just give you ground state subspace. So only in that subspace it commutes with uh, Hamilton. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So next is Giannetti. Hi. Um, thank you for for your talk. I have a question related to your uh, last slide, if possible. Mm -hmm. Um. So you said this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that yeah. uh, you basically proved the degeneracy, mm -hmm. and you said it's not related to the spontaneous symmetry breaking. But I right. think I think it basically does not mean that this statement implies mm -hmm. that there is no symmetry breaking. So right, right. it's possible that there is a hidden order symmetry. Right, 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 right. We just don't yeah. see it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe my, my my statement was not quite correct. So so this of course does not rule out the possibility of some spontaneous symmetry breaking by you know some other mechanism but uh, still uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in usual sense alone cannot explain this uh, kind of topological degeneracy so i think it's possible that uh, you have so-called topological order uh, plus Possibly some other spontaneous symmetry breaking. That's always possible, but uh, that uh, I cannot say anything uh, directly from this kind of argument because uh, you, you can always have uh, extra degeneracy due to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Thanks. So basically, you 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 think that if there is an order, it's not related to this particular degeneracy. Uh, well, so I, I'm not sure what exactly you mean but, by hidden order, but, uh, yeah, but in, 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 you know, uh, multiple order and so on, those are... For instance, for instance, yeah, mm -hmm. if, if you, uh, you, you look at the, like, let's say, X, X, Z more, right? Mm -hmm. so you, and you just do, for instance, periodic perturbation, etc. So you, mm -hmm. uh, you have your plateaus, etc. So it's sort of topological order, but at the mm -hmm. same time, you can identify some string order on these lines and the, they have like for instance twofold degeneracy which basically uh classif classifies under this uh, umbrella topological order you see that uh there is some uh non-local order parameter mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's uh, it can be related to this uh yeah yeah order. so I mean, it's yeah. Like hard to find in general but there are many mm -hmm. examples where you can relate this uh Spontaneous symmetry breaking and topological order, and even indicate the yeah. order part. Uh, you mean uh, some breaking some of symmetry which is characterized by non-local order? Like Z two, Z two, and some some string order parameter. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so so some in the chain. Uh, may, may, but, may, yeah. So I, I mean, uh, I just meant that uh, this topological degeneracy is not consistent with. Uh, uh standard uh, sorry uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of uh conventional sense corresponding to local order yeah. parameter so if you uh, uh generalize this to something described by non local order parameter like string order parameter then it's different so it's yeah, yeah. thank you yeah, i agree sorry i was not clear enough okay elio so oh, uh, I was wondering about physical uh, mm -hmm. implementations. Mm -hmm. So 
what the, the case that you discussed is uh, uh, quasi particles which have charge p over q for some mm -hmm. gauge symmetry. So yeah. that's like fraction quantum hall, but are there other cases that this specific arguments apply to? Um, well, yeah, so maybe most, uh, I would say, reliable, uh, I mean, uh, already ex experimentally perhaps confirmed example is fractional quantum hall effect, but um, yeah, you can apply this to uh, uh, like a quantum dimer model, uh, this RVB type phase of quantum dimer model uh, can be regarded as uh, uh, fractionized phase because uh, if you have RVB type liquid of quantum dimers, uh, you can create a half dimer excitation using a string like uh, object. So that, that's one example. Yeah, Z2 spin liquids. Uh, Z2 so, spin liquids may not require constant particle number, but uh, at least some version of Z2 spin liquids can be understood in this way, yes. I see, so you can use these U1 insertions for Z2 spin liquids. Well, so I, I'm uh, just discussing uh, not the most generic version of Z2 Z2 spin digit, but uh, some Z2 spin digit realization uh, has a conserved uh, charge or U1 symmetry. In, in that case, I can apply this argument. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so there's, yes. there's still a few questions yeah. at the stage. Um, I think the next is from Okay. okay. Um, right, so uh, I have a question that's related to one that was just asked. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just wondering about where extra degeneracies can come from. So uh, in your previous slide, you, the last point is that uh, you have a degeneracy of um, greater than or equal to Q, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. Um, when this inequality happens, is that your question? Yeah, so uh, I wonder, uh, I think that um, all the, the topological degeneracy should be exactly Q, right? Because you you uh, take our particle hole pairs Q times and you get back to 2 pi times P. Um, well, so uh, everything that's more than that um, due to conventional uh, Well, yeah, degeneracy. so, so I, I mean, yeah, so I just mean that the uh, 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 um, q to the power of g, what q to the power of 2g is uh, degeneracy I can uh, show from this kind of ex argument, but uh, uh, you know, uh, as you said, uh, this argument does not rule out, let's say, the presence of more conventional spontaneous symmetry breaking happening at the same time then you must double all the degeneracy and so on. Uh, so I'm just leaving uh, other possible uh, mechanism for degeneracy. So in fact, you can say that uh, the topological degeneracy will be exactly Q or Q to the G or something. Right, because uh, uh, you know, I, I cannot rule out you know, something else happening in the system. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, actually, I have to say that, uh, precisely speaking, even this uh, uh, inequality is sometimes wrong, because uh, in this argument, I assume that uh, you drag the quasi-particle around the hole, and then I implicitly assume that uh, you can always pair annihilate this pair, which might sound trivial, but uh, actually, here I'm assuming the so-called abelian uh, statistics and uh, if you have uh, non abelian statistics then which means that uh, these quasi particles have some internal state and uh, sometimes it happens that uh, you pair create and uh, drag one quasi particle around the hole then you try to pair annihilate but uh, sometimes you cannot pair annihilate in that case you cannot generate uh, 
new ground state. So actually in that case, uh, non-abelian statistics, uh, the real number of ground state can be less than this kind of uh, constraint uh, that we discussed in some other, another paper. But uh, that, that's a caveat. So in case of non-abelian statistics, uh, we have to be a little bit more careful because uh, sometimes you cannot annihilate. Right, thanks. Okay, so the next question is from Tamagna Hazra. Hi, uh, so I was wondering about how to reconcile this uh, definition of topological order that you have with fractionalization because uh, this definition of topological order seems to involve the manifold on which the Hamiltonian is defined in a very crucial way. So the same Hamiltonian defined on a torus mm -hmm. and something different, say a sphere or a plane seems mm -hmm. to have different topological order since it allows different possibilities for inserting the flux. So topological order does not seem to be uniquely defined by the Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian is what defines whether there are fractionalized quasi particles. Mm -hmm. I, I, so what am I missing here? Because a Hamiltonian can have fractionalization, but if you define it on different manifolds, mm -hmm. on some of these manifolds, it may not have fractionalized topological order. Uh, well, okay. So, wow. Well, so, yeah, I, I don't know what is the best answer because the topological order is, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, very vaguely defined concept uh, because it's not conventional order, uh, but uh, something is happening. Um, so it's uh, abstract notion. And uh, one of the uh, signature we believe of topological order is topological degeneracy. So, so the a uh, hidden physical assumption is that uh, physics shouldn't depend much on uh, real physics, like observable physics, uh, like uh, whether the, you, you have fractionalized quasi particle or not, should not depend on the topology of the manifold. That's a uh, physical intuition. Uh, although it's not really trivial, I agree. Um, so this notion of topological degeneracy is that uh, you have basically the same Hamiltonian and you can define uh, this Hamiltonian on torus or double torus or sphere and uh, all the quasi particles and so on does not depend on the topology but ground state degeneracy increases as you go to higher topology um, that we believe as a kind of signature of topological order which is more abstract notion um, so it's well, no, not completely clear cut, uh, at least for me. But, uh, that's uh, how we we interpret this this essay. So, so is that a mathematical uh, uh, problem that uh, the real topological order that would be observed in experiments may not show up if you do the calculation on a certain manifold, and will show up if you do it on a certain other manifold? Well, yeah. So it's I don't know. It's a hard problem. Um, Oh yeah, so so okay, yeah. Maybe there is confusion. So there is some help from uh, Gunnar in the chat window. So so here manifold means that uh, just uh, you define the system on some space. So uh, most often we consider torus. Uh, we define the system on the uh, you know. Uh, rectangle, but uh, if you impose periodic boundary condition on both directions, then this rectangle is uh, becomes torus. But uh, well, it, actually, in case of lattice model, it's not easy to define the system on sphere or double torus. But uh, in system defined in continuous space like a fractional quantum whole state, you can define the system on torus or double torus or sphere or whatever space you can you you like and uh, then the same hamiltonian same lagrangian on different uh, space um, you find a different ground state agency uh, then we interpret this as a signature of topological order which is more abstract notion i, I don't know what, what is a simplest way to define the topological order, but uh, it's uh, something abstract, which is supposed to be behind many exotic 
phenomena like fractionalization and so on. Thanks. So next we have a question from Gautam Nambia. Mm -hmm. Gautam, have you? Um, uh, yeah, so my question was, uh, so, we, so we were uh, labeling the uh, ground state eigenstates by eigenvalues of Tx, and then mm -hmm. we said we apply an fx, and then applying yeah. fx uh, essentially amounted to a permutation of these labels right. of Tx, right? Yeah, yeah, but exactly, then, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then, but uh, is, is such a scenario possible where instead of a permutation, you get a superposition of uh, different labels of Tx? Uh, well, once you establish uh, this uh, commutation relation, then uh, you know if it's just uh, shift the eigenvalue one eigenvalue to the next. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, but, but it won't course, mix. It cannot mix. Um, well, well, once you establish this commutation relation, then uh, the rest is straightforward. Although. We cannot rule out uh, extra degeneracy always because, uh, uh, for example, suppose you find one eigenvalue of Tx, then applying Fx, uh, you change the eigenvalue of Tx by this phase factor. Mm. And uh, you apply Fx twice, then you get a phase factor, this factor squared, and uh, three times cubed, and so on. Uh, so you can repeat this process up to Q times. So you can find Q different eigenvalues of Tx zero. So you must have at least Q degenerate ground state. That was the argument. But yeah. uh, of course, it's possible that the Tx zero has uh, different eigenvalue uh, not generated by Fx. Then you can also apply Fx to that different eigenvalue. Then again, you have Q set of uh -huh. different eigenvalue sure. of Tx. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's why I, I can say. Uh, the ground state degeneracy from derived from this argument is a uh, multiple of Q, but uh, ah. it's possible that uh, you have two Q or three Q. Got it, got it. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from the chat here from Yu Chin Xiang. Um, how to apply a function insertion in a 3D system? Uh, oh, how to apply flux insertion in. Right. So. The only way I know that is a straightforward application of this is uh, really, uh, uh, yeah, essentially same as uh, 2D. That is, um, yeah, we can, uh, you know, impose periodic boundary condition in one direction, then the system looks like uh, some. Uh, cylinder with hole inside, then we can certainly insert magnetic flux in this hole. So in case of 2D system, this hole is just a, you know, uh, inside of circle. There is no thickness. But uh, in three-dimensional case, you can imagine some cylinder with a hole in the center. Then uh, now the magnetic flux must go all the way from the bottom to the top of this hole. Um, that's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, in this way, I'm inserting the magnetic flux essentially in 2D way. Um, so maybe there are more clever way to use three dimensional space uh, topology, but uh, yeah, what I know is just, uh, yeah, simply impose periodic boundary function. Insert a flux, like in 2D case. And uh, that was the first question. And the uh, second question, does this trick require U1 symmetry in the system? Right, yeah, so basically, if you don't have uh, U1 symmetry, then, hmm, okay. Um, um, yeah, you don't have uh, this large gauge transformation symmetry, for example, I guess, because uh, uh, this 
elimination of the flux, I guess, is one one version of gauge symmetry. So if you don't have, if you don't even have local, uh, I mean, low, global U1 symmetry, then I guess there is no gauge symmetry as well. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. And we have yeah. one final hand raise, which is Yasa Kamjani. Um, if you could um, uh, mute yourself. So, so uh, my question is that uh, you created this uh, uh, traction analyzed particles, crosshair particle and crosshair fold, and then you went around the fold and annihilated mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, presumably, if, if there is some some internal gauge field is involved, you are left over with the left with the with the string around the right, around right, the, yeah, yeah. So, is that a string? Is, sorry, that would be a, like a Wilson. But is that by itself enough to shuffle the ground state states in the ground state? Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing. So, so one, once you have this kind of interpretation, then you can understand the uh, um, degeneracy. Um, so. Uh, in so without, without flux in without flux insertion, just because. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, well, yeah. So, um, wow. Well, so, of course, uh, I, I mean, uh, you, you, yeah. If you know that uh, moving around Kzi particle involves uh, dragging of uh, string, leaving the uh, trace as uh, in the form of string, then uh, you can show the uh, ground state degeneracy. So. Uh, in that case, I'm just showing the equivalent results by different arguments. So I'm not saying you always need this argument, but uh, uh, in some sense, what I'm showing here is that uh, once, you, in order to have fractalization, you need something like string. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and That's, uh, uh, the question is that uh, presumably you have a, a bunch of uh, particles in the in the theory that their mm -hmm. charges add up still to the dose that you had in the UV, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so and, and then you need to locally create different ones. So the question is that, uh, do they ever cancel each other? I mean, uh, so that the that the that the ground state degeneracy uh, on the torus, for example, is not what mm -hmm. you uh, said in the next slide, or mm -hmm. do they always add up? Um. Well, I. Okay, I'm not hundred percent sure, but uh, my quick answer would be as long as you can uh, create uh, each type of quasi particle, quasi particle whole pair independently, then you know each process gives you some degeneracy. So they just add up or multiple. But uh, if there is some constraint, uh, like uh, in order to create this particle, you must also create this particle together in in the presence of such constraints, then maybe there's some uh, cancellation or deduction, maybe. Thank you. Okay, let's um, thank um, Professor Ashikawa for a fantastic talk. Thank I couldn't cover as much as I wanted, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's my fault. Uh, well, okay, I will adjust the uh, content of next talk. Yeah. Wonderful Thanks talk. for listening, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think in the, the way in which we've been managing this over the last couple of days is that for the next half hour, we will break out into a and, number of breakout you, rooms. You, You've ended us five minutes early, actually, Andrew, but I guess that's okay. Um, in principle- I didn't see any more questions in the chat. In principle, oh. Mazaki could have shown us some of the other slides, but- um, Oh yeah, so I had the second topic. <laughs> okay, so maybe that's better maybe. to leave on the PDFs or bring out next time. Okay. Uh, so shall we go to the breakout rooms and meet together in- uh, in just over half an hour then, or, or would anyone like to ask a last few questions to Mizaki? Yeah, there is some question on the chat window. Or is, yes, that's is true. Yes, new? I just noticed it. Uh -huh. Yes, Bogdan Gallo has, has asked about taking the trace of tau mm -hmm. times tilde f. Mm -hmm. In page 19. So uh, he asked, he asks, if you take the trace of your equation, uh, uh -huh. does this 
pose some constraints on some group representation of tau zero tilde f? Um, yeah, so I forgot the exact mathematical terminology, but uh, this kind of uh, commutation relation is uh, one of the very basic uh, example in appearing group theory. Uh, so, 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 yeah, this is like a ZN group and generator. Um, so, yeah, so I guess if you just, yeah, if you just take trace, then this trace becomes zero means that, uh, um, how to say, so uh, if you diagonalize one of them, like a T0, then F operator just shift this eigenvalue, which means that uh, if you take trace, you know, uh, you, you are mapped from one eigenstate to different eigenstate, then take trace means that uh, it's zero. So yeah, this trace being zero is related to the fact that uh, you must have degenerate ground state, more than one ground state, and uh, this F operator maps one ground state to different ground state. Very good. And uh, it's related to representation theory, yes. Very good. And Alexei Kudzorov says, uh, oh, that's an answer to the last one, so that's good. So I think we've covered everything. Um, I think uh, uh, let's give, uh, Masaki, will you be able to come? I know it's going to be very late for you. Will you be able to come to the student run discussion later? Yeah, I, yeah, I will try. Yeah, so okay. far I feel okay, but uh, please excuse me if, you know, I fall asleep. You realize it's incredibly I, late for you. Uh, we're really well, appreciative. Um, but uh, I, I will try to join, yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks. Okay, so let's give Masaki a, uh, 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 round of applause. Another round of applause. Okay, and uh, very good. So we will now uh, split into breakout rooms, and we'll come back in. Uh, we'll come back in half an hour's time.